employees and the, the, the cool and so on, um, they're doing some work in the, the treasurer's, in the income tax office, and things may be coming in and out behind us, so I apologize for the setting. The price is right, if nothing else. So if I can have uh, Cindy and Chris both tell us, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who you are and how you became interested in knitting. I'm Chris Triola and I have been a resident of Lansing since coming up here in the 60s to go to Mich Michigan State. And I graduated as an art major and my field was painting. And I definitely was going to be a professional painter. Well, I got a job teaching art in the Waverly schools and there was a loom in that room. So I learned how to weave and I fell in love with yarn. And if you're passionate about anything, gardening or food or anything, you understand how it takes a hold of you. So I fell in love with yarn and I started going all around the country studying with weavers of all kinds. I joined the Lansing Weavers Guild, then the Hand Weavers Guild of America and studied with some of the best. And I wanted to find a way to put my drawing and painting together with my love of yarn. And that process took another 20 years because the weaving you could do straight, uh, plain solid colors, plaids, or fancy weaves, but they were all set and repeated. And I had learned about computerized knitting, these little knitting machines. And so I found a lady in the community. It's just incredible to me that I am doing something that's so mechanically <laughs> sophisticated. Um, and I am not. I am a low-tech gal. <laughs> Painters, you know, you can repeat yourself a hundred times, let it dry and paint over it. Not so with knitting. So um, I've always had people working for me doing the mechanics of what I do. So I asked some ladies in the community, and it was very clandestine, my husband, who taught in the East Lansing schools, would deliver bags of yarn to their homes, and they would knit it up, and then he'd pick up the bags from <laughs> and bring them to my studio. Long story short, um, I started in then adding solid color knits to my woven clothing. People started asking for my clothing. I was teaching every day. And after about 15 years of teaching and discovering computerized knitting, I got the itch to leave teaching. And so after about five years, and doing drawings that the little computers on these little knitting machines could do. You slide a drawing in, it can read it and knit your designs. And so at one point before I left teaching, and I taught for 20 years in the Waverly Schools, the last few years I was um, <clears throat> selling my work, mainly in the area and trunk shows in people's homes and that type of thing. And I sent my slides in because I'd heard of this big show out in Baltimore <laughs> that everybody went to. And I got accepted the first year, which is kind of unheard of. And so I called in sick every day <laughs> from out there. And in five days, I nearly did a half a year's salary. Oh, that's oh, awesome. So Very good. I came back and I said, but what if I never get in again to another show? Well, I waited a year, kept dreaming, kept plotting, applied again, got in again, did even more. And that was the end of teaching. And um, so in the beginning, I worked out of my home. Then we had a place, some of you may know my history, but we've, my husband and I have had galleries down at, by old Clara's there, and then um, out on North Lake Lansing Road for a while. And now, for the last 15 years, we've owned a building on Mount Hope by Pennsylvania next to Smith Floral. And my husband 
who's also a retired teacher, does uh, collectibles and estate sales around the community. And I do the knitting. And this is my knitting machine now. Oh. And for what I had to pay for it, I could live in it probably. But they, the small knitting machines went out of business at about the same time that I was getting really quite known nationally. So my husband's my biggest cheerleader and he said let's just step up to the plate and get one of those big things <laughs> so we did and this semi drove up and oh, they delivered this thing and what it does and what i do am i talking no, too no, much feel free. um i am as a painter you read the world and you see it with a, an eye like a musician has an ear. Mm -hmm. And so we have a cottage along Lake Michigan and most of my designing comes from up there. And these are kind of cryptic, but I found them and thought you might learn from them. This is a close up shot of Lake Michigan, the, the pattern that the waves make on the sand. I would see that so I don't walk very fast anywhere I go because I'm looking. And then I would do something like this when I got back to the studio. I have to interpret it in black and white. So this then has to be shrunk because the computer has to have a small little drawing. And we would feed it into the computer on the knitting machine, this big one. And it has its own room with computers in a different room. and then this is what it would make. So all of my designs, the jacket I'm wearing, I was standing on the dock at my family's cottage and the reeds on the shore were making reflections on the water, so I took a picture of that. And then I just worked with the design, you know. The computer reads my drawing as rows and columns. So it kind of skews it after you put it in. And then I design more on the computer. But I don't design on a computer screen. Lots of times I do actual drawings, lots of times photographs, and cut them up. And that's what I love to do, and that's what I'm still doing. And I'm progressing now into wall pieces. And I just received a major commission for a 13 foot by 6 foot wall hanging. So I'm really excited about that. But clothing. I don't know why I chose clothing. I think that was one of your <laughs> questions. It was just something I liked doing and people seemed to want to buy it and that paid the bills so that felt right. <laughs> Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy McCormick and I've been a weaver for 40 years. I used to say 35 years for a long time, but it's more like 40 years. And I learned how to weave um, from my grandmother that was a farmer and a logger out towards Mason area and she was a rough woman so it was it was quite a um, childhood life with my grandmother teaching me how to weave and um, and then I met this other lady uh, in my life named Betty Bach ten years ago and she she made socks for Eddie Bauer and has taught me how to weave and knit socks on an antique sock knitting machine. I have always refurbished and, and restored machines and growing up we had a motorcycle shop also so I, I learned at a very early age to do mechanical stuff and 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 I still like motorcycles, but I but these machines won't hurt you, you know, and you can fall and you won't get hurt. So 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 anyway, I I, I do a lot of my um, things now on a on a sock knitting machine, and, and it doesn't just make socks; it makes a variety of different items, and. Uh, and I'm glad that that noise is happening because I'm really bad at a microphone. <laughs> it's doing great. So, so this is my first time out. So, anyway, um, I I grew up in Eaton Rapids and I now live in Grand Ledge and that's where my studio is at. And I um, I have worked on all sorts of machines. Um, there's over 26 different machines that I've worked on and refurbished and have people people making socks and some people are making a living at it. Um, I have some students here tonight 
they're sitting here in the front and their their work is up here on stage so what they have what they have learned is up here on the stage and and um and that's that's do you there. mainly teach or do you sell your stuff? I, I i sell i sell my items i sell my machines i teach um because there's a huge learning curve with these machines and you've got to you got to teach people how to operate these machines and get them to know the noise that it makes. Because um, the machine, I always say, you got to become one with your machine to understand it, to make it work right. And um, you just can't jump on one of these old machines and make it work right. You got to get to know it. You got to get to know what yarns it takes. And, and um, so that's. It. When we started to put together this event, I, I knit myself the two-stick variety only, and I started thinking about how old is knitting even as a craft? You know, we're talking about mechanical knitting, we're talking about computer knitting, and so I'd like to pose the question to these ladies and, and see a little bit about what they know about the history of knitting. Is there a theory as to how or where it originated? Well, I, I have seen on shows, it's been in pyramids, where there's been these, these pictures on the pyramid walls of people with sticks in their knitting. So, you know, somebody had to knit those garments, you know, so that's, that's how early it is. Knitting is a one-strand technique versus weaving, which creates right angles, you see, yeah. interlock. So a woven structure is much stronger than a knitted structure. And a knitted structure moves. That's why it's pliable and flexible. It's one thread manipulated to interlock with another thread, another row upon row. But that's why you can take that <laughs> apart instantly, too. Yep. If you've ever dropped a stitch, you know how fast that can happen. Oh, yeah. So early forms of one strand I know nothing about the knitting history, but there is something called spraying that was, if you can envision early fishermen making nets, mm -hmm. they did that without any needles right. and just by hand. Mm -hmm. And I did learn that in my weaving days. And it's just twisting it, interlocking it, and coming back. Yeah, there's all kinds of wonderful things. Macrame, some of you know that term. So there's lots of different techniques with one strand of cord or yarn. But, um, and I'm sure they go way back for clothing and fish netting and things like that. Out of curiosity, how many of you here tonight are knitters? Mm -hmm. Several. Now, when I think of knitting, I think of what I do at home. I think of the two sticks and the ball of yarn and the occasional unladylike language that happens when I drop it. And I owe much to my mother who deals with my mistakes that I make when I knit. But I am very interested in the thought of, I guess, what I think of as mechanical knitting. And I'm curious, when did we, when did we start knitting with machines and how did that come about? Give it a chat. I know of a, a story, it was from the 1500s, where this queen was a hand knitter, and she had a boyfriend that, that didn't get to spend any quality time with her, so he made a knitting machine hoping that he could have her knit on that machine and he could spend time with her. But she liked the finer things, like, like silks and finer linens where the, the wools that it took to weave, to knit on that machine was rougher, so they they quit making it. And so, you know, that was the end of that relationship. It worked too well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I know about that. I can add the, um, we have looked at, my husband and I, some of the real early mills out east. And during the Industrial Revolution, there were knitting machines and the mills out in the East Coast are still, there are skeletons yeah. of knitting machines yeah. in them. And most of them were circular, yes. but huge. You could walk inside yes. of them. Yeah. And um, it was huge in that area of the country, yes. knitting. Um, and then, of course, with the cotton, 
the American cotton was our whole culture yeah. for I don't know how long centuries. And yes. so we have huge textile tradition, yep. and that includes knitting as well as weaving. And that's all gone. I know. That's all gone. The type of machine that I use now, as far as I know, and I'm not saying it to pat myself on the back, but um, I'm the only independent artist in the country that stepped up to the plate. These are for industry, and they can knit extremely fast but you can set the speed on them. And when I first went, I had to go to New York to the Stoll headquarters. It's a German knit, knitting machine, but we have an American headquarters for them. And the only question they asked me was how fast you needed to go, and I just choked. I said, I'm not very fast. I make limited edition artware. And um, then the second question was, what's your building made out of? Is it, can, is it sturdy enough to handle this because they would have people uh, wanting to put them in their apartments on the 15th floor in Manhattan. <laughs> and so now this industry is so huge that this company's main headquarters is in Singapore and they're knitting for the world. Yeah. And yeah. it's just a streamlined, very sleek, very incredible thing compared to what we all started with. Now you mentioned a knitting machine that's big enough you could walk into. Mm -hmm. What kinds of products and, and um, goods are made on knitting machines in general? There are two kinds basically. Flatbed and that was for blankets and just yardage. Yeah. Mine is a flatbed machine. The circular machines, the kind that you could walk in that I'm talking about, they also did flatware knitting. My machine can also do what's called full fashion knitting. And I did that for several years. In other words, when you are decreasing or increasing shaping, this machine would do that. But it seemed like we'd do the whole body and get up to the casting off at the neck and it would glitch and throw the whole thing off. And I just couldn't stand it. And it didn't really address my artistry because I couldn't figure out where to place the design and shape it with the computer. So um, after about 10 years, I gave that up and just do yardage and it's much easier. Most, all clothing, all clothing in the stores is done with yardage and you overlock with a, a surging machine so that it does not unravel. So you look, even the best designers in the world are doing that. But the full fashion knitting, um, there would probably be some old European yeah. style knitting yeah. going on. I agree with what Chris just said. It's, it's either flatbed or yardage. That's basically what we're making. What are some of the, obviously, one advantage of having machine knitting is the fact that you can produce yardage, as you said. Um, you can produce garments presumably faster than you would sitting there with your, with your two needles. What are some of the challenges, though, that machines bring to the process? Cindy, you've done a lot of repair work and so on. <laughs> The, the challenges are learning the, uh, the stitch length and what the yarn can... There's different sizes of yarns and so your stitch length, it, it's hard sometimes with different lengths of um, your stitch length and your yarns are heavier or smaller and, and then the weights that you use, um, when it pulls that down, you might have too much weight weight on the needles and it might it might break your your yarns and, you know so if you're if you're using like a finger lane weight yarn you wouldn't put four pounds of weight on and so that creates a challenge for someone new not understanding the that that process but the advantages of doing the machine is you can make the socks faster, you can make your items faster, and Monday I made three pairs of socks to give to family members, and you know, they make gifts really fast, and you know, compared to four weeks of knitting a sock, you know. So, 
that's that's the challenges that I see in it. It's learning learning your machine and just learning the stitch length and the tension and all that. So true. And the yarn is a whole language of itself. Um, at my production level, and it's not high, I probably produce 1,000 to 1,200 garments a year, 100 a month, but even at that, I have to buy yarn, not on a skein, but on a cone, and I think in the showcase there are a couple of cones of my yarn going through it, and I gang it together in the eyes of the needle. Well, that took 20 years to learn yeah. what size yarn, and my first story, you'll appreciate this, I don't know how you learned, but I just decided to call some of these companies. I got a hold of a blue book to the industry, and I said I was interested in getting some yarn, and the lady said, what size do you want? And I said, well, somewhere between sewing thread and kite string. <laughs> and she said, oh, honey, you need help. <laughs> What are you doing with it, you know? And I tried to tell her I have a knitting machine. What's the gauge? I don't know. <laughs> so, you know what Cindy's yes. saying is so true. There's a number of needles per inch. Yeah. And the size of yarn has to fit the number of needles. Yes. So, my knitting machine has 10 needles per inch. That one up there is much finer than that, it looks like. Yeah, it, going it, on. yeah it can go, it can, my machines, they, they go all the way from 52 to 100. So, and, and it can make really fine hoseries, or mm -hmm. if you can try to put some heavier yarn in, you can make a large hat in the 100 slot cylinder, but it's, it's mm. tough. So. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the yarns you use? Obviously, there's there's wools. I've seen yarns made of bamboos, and there's cottons and all sorts of things. What do you use, and why do you think you gravitate towards those materials? I use a wide variety of many different kinds of yarns. Um, uh, fingerling weight yarn, lace weight, all the way to DK weight, worsted weight. Um, and all different kinds of fibers. Um, I use possum wool from Australia. I use I use uh, mink. I've got a, a cone of mink yarn up there, and um, alpaca, exotic yarns. I love to use exotic yarns. They're really soft, and um, and then I use regular sock weight yarn, and have a person that I know dye it for me, so it gets bright and pretty, and um, so it. It's a wide variety, but I really like the exotic yarns. It keeps your feet warmer in the winter, and, and the bright colors are for summer when you can show them off in your sandals and that type of thing. I'm the exact opposite. I use one kind of yarn. I learned to control it, and I said, this is fine. And because I wanted to make a living doing this, I decided, it was just a calculated thing, that if I made something in cotton, I could sell it in New England and in Texas. Yeah. And seasonally, I didn't want to do seasonal. I'm not part of the fashion world, I'm part of the art to wear world. And I sell through galleries and high-end art shows. But um, cotton has no elasticity. Right. All of the fibers that Cindy's using sounds like they have, the animal fibers are elastic, they have a different cellular structure. Cotton will break yep. easily. I didn't know any better. Not only that, but um, what we didn't know that turned out to be such a bonus is that um, cotton will not felt if you wash it but it will draw in and settle down and become softer. So you still have to gauge uh, what you're doing because something you knit at one width on the knitting bed is, after you wash it, is going to be smaller, but not significantly, not like wool will. Yeah. Well, um, I didn't know that a lot of people in the art world do not wash anything. And so their clothing says dry clean only. And I'm one of the few that you throw these in the washing machine and dryer and they come out just like this because we've already done that in the hottest washing machine and dryer. And it served me well. So.
I, I do the same. Want to I, I do the same thing because I want to make sure that when someone buys something, yes. that it's not going to come back to me. I right. want I want to pre shrink everything and yeah, the same as Chris. Can you talk about where your yard comes from? Yeah. You mentioned some different animals, yeah. but um, do you get it from? Uh, do you get some of it locally from yes. people who spin? Yes, yeah. I've got some of the wools that I brought tonight are from local farmers, local mills that processed it for me, and um, and I I try to do that quite a bit, and I also take students up there so they can buy from the local mills and and help them out also, and I and I buy yarns from all over the world, um, Australia a lot and um, Europe. In our own country, um, but usually from my local farmers for a lot of things. Again, very different, and mine is a little bit uncomfortable right now. Cotton comes in a variety of grades. As think about a sheet, and you could buy something that's kind of stiff all the way up. Well, I use Pima cotton which is a shortened term for Supima, and it's a very high level, so this doesn't wrinkle. Now, in this country, we don't grow very much cotton anymore, and with the recession, the mill that I used, and they spun the yarn, and they dyed it for me, and my minimums are pretty high because I'm riding this line between industry and art, so I'm buying at the industrial level, but they were dying it in the smallest kettles they had, which was a 100 pound minimum per color. Well, that mill with the recession went out of business about four years ago, and they had been in business for over 120 years in this country, and that's typical of what's going on. So we both kind of cried on the phone, and I said, what am I supposed to do now? And they said, we're going to give you the name of an agent and he will find the yarn for you. And then we're gonna recommend that you go to this mill for dyeing a dye house. And all of this is down in the southern states. But the rep told me that you may have to import from either Egypt or Peru. They're growing a fine cotton. And I guess at that point I might retire. <laughs> You mentioned color. Um, uh, the products that both of you produce are very colorful products. You mentioned a, a few minutes ago, colors for summer and so on. I'd like you to talk about um, what kind of colors you like to use and what that does for your work, how that informs it. Well, I, I've got three golden retrievers and when I walk the golden retrievers, some of the sunsets that I see, those inspire me, the sunsets of all different colors inspire me, um, nature, fall coming up, those colors in the trees, I just, that inspires me of the colors that I want to use. And um, and that's what everybody likes, is, is what, you know, the nature of what we see, and, and those colors are what I want to use, so that's the colors I look for. Color is another language for me because I'm a painter. So I have the established a palette years and years ago, thinking that if I kept my yarn cheap enough and the program simple enough, I could put more money into equipment and people to run the equipment. And so I have had the same color palette for probably at least 15, maybe 20 years. And what that does, I can pull, um, well, if you come up to the table afterwards, I can show you, but I told you that I use small yarn, so I can put different colors together. So I'm mixing colors and making my own. So the sky's the limit, really. So it's like a palette, and then I just mix. And it was said early on that my work is slightly understated. And that goes for the color and the design of the garment as well as the graphic. And I thought that was a put down, but it turned out to be good. A favorite painting professor, some of you may have known Clifton McChesney, he and his wife Jane McChesney 
were in the area, it was painters for forever. But anyway, he was my favorite painting professor and he said, cut the sweetness. Just have it be where you can look at it for a long, long time. So I tone them down just a little bit. There's a bit of neutrality in each. And that means you'll wear that same thing for There are some forms of knitting that have a lot of pattern work in it. And you mentioned when you were weaving, Chris, you, know, you could do plaids and you could do stripes and things. Are there any particular patterns that you have enjoyed using either as a weaver or as a knitter over the years that are traditional? I don't know. <laughs> well, with weaving, I've, um, like I said, with nature, I, I, I love the northern lights. So with weaving, I've had a, a blank warp. When I say blank, it's a natural warp, and I, I do painted warps and I incorporate all those colors in the painted warp. And then I, I let that dry for 24 hours, and then after it's dry, I, I weave it. And then when I wash it, it's just, it looks like the Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's for weaving. I, I, that's how I get my colors that way. And then with my sock machine and that type of thing, I have someone dye my yarns, and then I just like, a pico edge and hats and gloves and mittens and I also use beads to embellish um, in those pico edges and um, that's what I do. Even if you're not a knitter, some of you guys here especially, I bet you all know the terms knit and purl. <laughs> and knitting or a knit stitch is a little more vertical and a purl stitch is a little more horizontal. And my technique, my machine could do anything I wanted it to do. And over the years I experimented, I settled on what's called a reverse jersey. So it's knit and purl. Cindy, if you hold that, I can show you. So the, the graphic here is knit, excuse me, is purled and the background is knit. It's a double bed knitting machine, so it's going back and forth, knitting and purling at the same time. The reverse side is nothing more than the reverse side. It's not the wrong side, so I could use it as well. So wherever it's knitting on the front, it's purling on the back, the reverse jersey. So it's a knit purl double layered fabric. And it's as simple as that, just two stitches. Yeah. So, and, and then weaving, that's called the summer and winter weave. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, you mentioned, you've talked a little bit about, you had a commission for a wall hanging. We've talked about socks. We've talked about sweaters. What other, are there any other types of garments, art, et cetera, that you're producing different forms? In the course of the 25 years I've been doing this, I actually had a store of my own in Ann Arbor for eight years, and at that point I was getting off track and people wanted everything to go with. So I had skirts, I had dresses, oh my goodness. But when yarn got pretty scary, the whole thing changed, and I, I just want to do art garments, and mainly jackets. But we do some pullovers, and we do a lot of shawls and some purses now. I even hung one of those with some of my scrap <laughs> and uh, some piece of uh, um, scarves and things. This jacket that I have on is kind of the last phase, I think, and it's where I'm knitting enough to do the garment itself, but I've archived all of my scrap and it's just a palette in my back room on shelves according to color. And so I just pull enough scrap to detail the garments. And my signature is a patch on the back, so they all have a patch and that's all scrap. So that seems to be a nice way of working for me. On the circular machines, you can, I have a little book and I haven't done them all, but they said in this little book that you can do a hundred different items. Okay, so with that little machine up there, you can wow. do a hundred different items. That's incredible. It is, and I have not done a hundred different <laughs> items. I'm just telling what the book said. <laughs> um, 
um, I keep busy with what I do, and uh, that, that serves me well. Now, I'm guessing most of us who are here tonight are hobbyists. I know some of you are taking lessons from Cindy. I'd like to finish by asking, how did you take this from a hobby to a business? And what potential advice would you have to offer to someone who might want to follow in your footsteps? <laughs> I, I like to refurbish machines. Um, people want to buy machines. People want to learn. So it was the demand, and, and, and people kind of pushed me in that direction. It was, it was a demand of people wanting things and 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 then finding finding the machine sometimes was a, it's hard to do because a lot of people don't know what they are and i have found them in barns that help barn doors open and you know, so you can imagine what's on those machines but anyway <laughs> so so when i refurbish them and sell them i'm not i'm not gouging the price it's worth all of that <laughs> That's all I got. Well, I have the ultimate good fortune of having a brother-in-law, my sister's husband, who was a CPA, and he was kind enough to take me under his wing because that is a whole different world. The business of having people work for you and taxes and complying with everything, oh my goodness, and then shipping and labeling. And, oh, you know, it's just an awful lot, but mainly the financial and the legality of filing and having people with unemployment and just all of that. And over the years, um, at first, I really thought I would quit. I remember one year when he called me to tell me that I didn't put enough in taxes, so I was going to have to pay, it was just thousands of dollars. I mean, small by where I am now, but um, back then I didn't have it. I had to borrow money to pay the IRS, and I just bawled on the phone. I said, I guess I'm not smart enough to do this. And he <laughs> said, yes, you are. Calm down. You'll learn. So the business of art is the scary it part. Is. It is. And you just have to keep trying, and you have to have people that believe in you yep. and are willing to keep going and my family luckily yeah. yes wanted and it's just great now yes i'd like to open it up now for questions from you what would you like to know about their knitting bonnie i got a question has there ever been a crocheting machine has there ever been a crocheting machine was the question not that i'm aware not that i'm aware, not that of, I'm aware of either no i guess no. you can't do it is that it <laughs> i mean it just hook. I don't know. It's a different process. It is. The hook. I just always wondered. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes, Barbara. Uh, yes, well, Chris, would you stand up and hold up your garment and show us how you put it together? You're saying you had uh, yard goods? Yes. The question is, if Chris could stand up and show us her garment and how it's actually assembled. It's, um, I have two women who are pattern drafters, so I'll do a real horrible, I can use duct tape sometimes <laughs> on a mannequin to stick the pieces together. It's basically a western version of a kimono. I keep it very simple. But this particular seams are drop, my seams so it's a drop sleeve, so it's a little bit coming in. It's very simple. Now where's your patch? You said you have a Here. Oh, they're all different. Every single one of them. They're like little mini compositions. I should tell you that when I design, it's like a painting for me. So the back is essentially a rectangle. And I always paint it on a vertical rectangle. So I do that first, and then I envision wrapping it around. And then the sleeves are very easy. Now, complementing, putting together different fabrics, you can do that or you can do it where they they don't really work. This happens to be real easy because it's the same design, it's just different tones. Down there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. Now do you have uh, see, uh, a pocket? Well, okay. Oh, and then it's faced. This is the surgeon. Mm -hmm. So the pattern is shaped. This has a curved line and then two little parts that stick and come around in the back. And so 
Is that selvage or ribbing? Down here it's ribbing. Ribbing. Yes. Oh. And sometimes we do that, sometimes we him. This is him. Well, what, and I don't mean it to be a paid advertising or anything, but um, people are so curious and it's, I love to share. Once I was told when I was getting my final degrees in painting, they looked at me and said, this doesn't fit. You don't feel like a painter. And I said, why not? And they said, because you're too much of a people person. So this is very nice for me. I, I like to go to the shows and share stories. And so we've opened the studio and every Friday from one till five at the Mount Hope location. And most Fridays I'm here. I travel quite a bit, but most Fridays I'm here. You can come in and watch. And you can come, the whole studio's open. I said to my assistant, who's got a studio gallery in the front with my husband's antiques and my stuff. And then the, you're welcome to go in my designing place where I'm working on the wall piece or the production space where the machine is and the seamstresses and that. And, and it's just fun fun Friday to share. One to Friday one to five. We would check it. And tonight over on Main Street on Washington in the old Lieberman's building, my assistant is having a trunk show for us. So after this, if you want to, you can come across the street. It's just right over there. And we have a nice selection of my husband's things and my things. What is the name of your studio? Just, it says Triolas on the sign, my last name. And it's because my husband and I share that building. Our dream when we were growing up, we've been together forever, was that we'd grow up someday and have a place called Antiques and Art. <laughs> he was gonna have early brown and broken like you find in barns, and I was gonna have paintings. So he's now selling modernism from mid-century, <laughs> and I do tech stuff. Go figure. <laughs> yes. Cindy, how old is your machine? Cindy, how old is your machine? 108 years old. Oh, oh yeah. man. And it works like it's brand new. Is that going to be an era what, that most of your machines originate from? Yes. Yes. They're all very old. Even older. Yes. Does anyone make these machines today? Yes. Oh, yes, they do. They, they're trying to put me out of business now. <laughs> How do you find the antique ones? Oh, um, the antique ones are like, if I tell you, then, then uh, you'll have to kill me. Yeah, I don't want to take that. <laughs> no, that, that's my secret. I gotta, I gotta keep that under wraps. Oh, so yeah. you, you know, privilege information. Well, yeah. it must be difficult. It is difficult because that's is. just a work of art itself. 